All right, so in this talk, I would like to give an overview of what I have called the Kripke-Ross argument, uh, KRA for short, for the immateriality of human formal understanding and activity. Um, so as a, as a way of introduction, these are the topics that I hope to cover. I know I have 40 to 45 minutes, so I, I hope to uh, cover everything as I intended within this time frame. If not, then I'll have to skip some things, but then maybe in the Q&A we can uh, get back to some of this, uh, some of these, some of these things. Okay, so uh, the argument I formulated in the following way. First premise, nothing, nothing that is wholly physical is uh, determinate amongst incompossible uh, formal operations. Intellectual activity is determinate amongst incompossible formal operations. Therefore, intellectual activity is not wholly physical. Premise one is established by considerations that emerge upon reflection on the work of the late American philosopher Saul Kripke, specifically his skeptical paradox and his unpublished arguments against computational functionalism. I'll have more to say about this uh, later on. Premise two is established on the basis of the late American philosopher James Francis Ross, who gave several arguments in favor of the formal determinacy of thought. That is, that intellectual activity is determined determinate amongst incompossible formal operations. I'll explain these terms uh, shortly. We shall also have something to say about this later on. So the first premise gives us a mark of the physical, that it is formally indeterminate. The second premise gives us a mark of the intellective, that it is formally determinate. What I will give here today is an intuitive proof or argument of the soundness of this argument as a more technical approach would not be possible within the time constraints, but I hope that the core idea of the argument will get through and that we can motivate more discussion and more research on this, on this argument. So before uh, moving forward, I wanna clarify some, term some terminology here. So the argument, KRA, as I constructed, concerns mathematical and logical rules and operations, not mathematical and logical objects, it is directed at the capacity and ability for applying or following mathematical and logical rules and what obtains on account of their application, definite patterns of calculation or reasoning. I will have nothing to say about mathematical and logical objects as such, for example, sets, numbers, geometrical figures, but much to say about operation, adding, negating, quantifying, inducing, deducing. I argue that intellectual activity, for example, doing mathematics, doing logic, thinking mathematically or logically, cannot be a physical activity, process, or operation, be it by identity, supervenience, or other form of analysis. There is no such thing as a material power by which formally determinate operations can be actualized. And that will be uh, the, the main claim that we will try to defend here. Notice the phrase formally determinate. And let me clarify what this means. By formally determinate, I mean that there are structural principles of intellectual activity whose application actualizes definite patterns of reasoning, thinking, or calculating. Such patterns constitute the form, read, structure of the thinking to be differentiated from the content of the thinking. For example, there is a difference between the form of an argument or operation say whether the argument is disjunctive syllogism, an instance of modus ponens or of Barbara, or whether the operation is one of addition or subtraction, so that's form. And another thing is the content of the argument, what the argument is about or what the operation is ranging over. For the moment, keep in mind that the key notion here is determinacy, and in particular, formal determinacy, not content or semantic determinacy. Now, I also want to point at this uh, at this moment that there have been some attempts at developing this argument or similar argument along semantic lines. So there is, for example, what I call the semantic or content-based version of the argument developed by the likes of Edward Edward Fazer. I think I think that's the pronunciation Fazer, and which I find somewhat troubling. This ver this version argues from the alleged semantic indeterminacy of the physical 
also phrased in terms of the physical being ambiguous or indeterminate with respect to conceptual content and the semantic determinacy of thought, that is the unambiguousness or determinacy of the content of the thought to the immateriality of the thought. So this is not the argument that I label KRA. I wanna make that distinction. I will come back to the semantic version when comparing Facer's version to mine. So I just wanna make clear that this version, I, I, I characterize as a formal or structural based argument for immateriality rather than a content based argument for immateriality. And this argument will argue, or I will argue from the form or, or structure of the operation, okay? That constitutes the operation as a logical or mathematical act and is therefore determined with respect to that form to the necessary immateriality of that type of thinking. Okay. Now, let me say a few words about uh, the background or the context of this argument. So the first premise, as I have it here, which comes from uh, Kripke's arguments or that is developed on the basis of Kripke's arguments, uh, the arguments that, that, I, that I refer to as being that of Kripke's are two. So there's the skeptical paradox, the famous skeptical paradox that Kripke develops. And then there's the unpublished arguments and critique that Kripke develops uh, uh, against computational functionalism. Now, uh, the interesting thing, or the thing that I want you guys to keep in mind as we go and defend the first premise, which I think it's, it's the one that's doing the heavy work in this argument, um, is that when, when we are talking about functions, the relation of the notion of functions or forms, which I use formal determination, formal operations, is related to this theory of mind that is called functionalism. Now, for the sake of, for simplicity's sake, I'll just define it this way, but functionalism was a theory that aimed, it was still supposed to be a naturalistic theory, but aimed to explain mental states, all mental states, or at least uh, depending on the version of functionalism, if it was computational functionalism, then our ability to compute functions, then this was supposed to be explained in terms of abstract functions or roles that are somehow implemented physically, right? And the commitment was that, well, we don't need to identify the mental state with a physical state or a type of physical state, sorry, but we can identify with the functional role that that physical state or those physical states implement. Now, Kripke develops uh, the unpublished critique, and so I'll develop it here in my way. I want to make it clear that this argument is Kripke as he struck Antonio, and so it's probably that Kripke won't um, uh, or wouldn't uh, uh, conclude all of these things, but I think that if we take Kripke's arguments to their full consequence or to the fullest extent, uh, to their full extent, I think this is what we are will be left with. So, uh, premise one, which I will point here again, that nothing wholly physical is determined amongst incompatible formal operations, was never explicitly formulated by Kripke, but he did formulate the arguments that lead to premise one. Now, a classic argument in analytical philosophy, now a classic argument in analytical philosophy, Kripke attempts to show that there is no fact of the matter as to whether anyone or anything can follow a determinate or mathematical rule. That's the famous skeptical paradox. For instance, take the addition function, which we all know. Now, Kripke ask, uh, asks us, take the non-standard function of addition, which Kripke defines as follows. Um, quadition is an operation that yields the same values as addition unless one of its operands is 57 or greater, in which case it yields five. So here's the definition you have that um, th this is the symbol of quadition. Uh, quadition will yield the same values as the addition function for any number less, less than 57. Otherwise, it gives you five, right? Now, Kripke develops this argument when he's commenting on what he takes to be Wittgenstein's paradox, because he takes it that Wittgenstein is developing a skeptical paradox. And in Philosophical Investigation, subsection 201, there's this statement by Wittgenstein that reads, this was our paradox. No course, of, no course of action could be determined by a rule because every course of action can be made out to accord with the rule, end quote. 
So Kripke asks us to consider the fact that addition and quotation coincide for a subset of their possible applications, but diverge for the totality of their possible applications. So addition and quotation coincide for any numbers less than 57, diverge afterwards. Notice, however, that this is not exclusive to addition. And the argument to be developed is not strictly speaking about addition. In fact, the argument can be developed using any mathematical and mutatis mutandis logical operation. The argument is concerned, as I will develop it, with the categorical or metaphysical account of what it is to carry out, that is, what it is to apply, follow, or realize a definite formal operation or formal rule. So the strategy is perfectly perfectly generalizable to any abstract rule, function, or operation. Take any standard mathematical or logical operation you like. Find a non-standard logical or, math or mathematical operation that coincides with the standard one for a sub subset of their possible arguments or applications, but diverges from it for the totality of its possible argument. Now suppose that 57 in our quotation example is just a placeholder for a number too great to be computed in a finite number of steps and time. Right? There will always be number too great to be computed. We're letting 57 just signify that. Following Paul Bogosian, we'll call this an inaccessible number. Addition and quotation are clearly mathematically distinct, and we can define them set theoretically if we wish. If we, if we wish. Yet the question arises as to what would be to apply either one determinately, given that their final applications coincide for all accessible numbers. Functionalism, as Kripke observed, offered, uh, according to many philosophers then, a naturalistic, that is, physicalistic account of what it is to carry out a formal operation. In broad outlines, the idea was that concrete formal operations must consist in the suitable physical implementation or realization of the abstract rule or operation in question. And that this is precisely what physical computing mechanisms already do. So isn't this already settled? Well, not quite. What the Kripke considerations allow us to see is that the determination of a mathematical or logical feature, uh, sorry, what the Kripke considerations allow us to see is that the determination of the mathematical and logical features of a physical mechanism are not completely a matter of its matter. That is, there is no such thing as a physical feature, property, or power that can fully determine or actualize amongst incompossibles, addition and quotation being incompossibles, a unique mathematical or logical operation. There is a difference between acting in accord with a rule and following or applying a rule, just as there is a difference between thinking about a rule and applying the rule. I will come back to, to that later. What PCMs do, that is physical computing mechanisms, what they do and reliably and reliably so is behave in accord with a set of formal rules that they do not, for they, can, for they cannot follow in any determinate and intrinsic sense. So before delving into a few thought experiments, let me state an important principle, which I think must be preserved if anything is to carry out a definite formal operation. And I call this principle exclusion. This is my terminology, uh, this is not creepy. So according to the principle of exclusion, for any formal rule F, the application of F excludes at the same time and in the same respect, the application of any other incompossible rule F prime. That is that whatever is supposed to account for the implementation of a given mathematical or logical function, so as to have a particular or determinate logical or mathematical operation must be so that it determines that it is that function and not some other incompatible or incompossible one, the one that is realized. That's what we mean by exclusion. And that's what guarantees determinate realization of mathematical and logical operations. Otherwise it will be indeterminate that there's any operation at all that is being carried out. And here's the thesis of formal, the formal indeterminacy of the physical, that there are no physical, this is the thesis that we aim to prove, that there are no physical features of a PCM that determinately, or, or can, that can determinately realize or actualize uh, formal properties or formal operations. So first thought experiment, let P be a PCM whose role is to carry out the addition function. 
Now, suppose that there is a twin Earth, and this, this, this example is taken from Hillary Putnam. Queen Earth is a physical duplicate of Earth. Um, it, has, uh, it is physically equivalent to Earth, but there are some differences there uh, that we'll, we'll explore in the following thought experiment. So suppose that there is a twin Earth where a physical duplicate of P, P sub E, exists. Call it P sub T E, right? Now, in, in Earth, P is supposed to carry out the addition function. In twin Earth, P, which is a physical duplicate of PE, PTE carries out the quaddition function. I right? recall that 57 is X hypothesis um, and an accessible number. Now, humans in twin Earth have what humans in Earth would call non-standard mathematics. Humans in twin Earth do quadratics; They do quaddition rather than addition, and then define addition in terms of quaddition. And now here's the conundrum. PE and PTE are physically equivalent mechanisms, yet formally non-equivalent mechanisms. That is, that the same physical or the, the same physical system or two systems that are physically equivalent, though physically equivalent, have formal properties that is carry formal operations that are incompatible between the two. So the question is, what accounts for the formal properties of these uh, physical mechanisms? The idea would be, or the thought experiment, is to show that there are no physical features of this PCM that can determine that it carries addition instead of quaddition. Okay, Kripke will use this. This is my example, but Kripke will develop something similar with, he, he has a different thought experiment about uh, having a physical computing machine just uh, emerge out of the blue or, or drop from the heaven, and then you have two different designers, a designer that's been trained in quantumatics, a designer that's been trained in mathematics, and both look at the same physical uh, mechanism, the property, the internal properties, the behavior, and each justifiably concludes. One concludes that it does quaddition, the other one concludes that it does addition. And the idea being that there's nothing in the intrinsic properties of the physical mechanism that can actually exclude uh, or can actually say that either one is wrong, that, that the physical mechanism satisfies both. A second thought experiment comes to us from Edward Stabler, who Interestingly enough, developed this sort of experiment as a response to Kripke, because when Kripke gave one of his unpublished talks, he was present. Kripke never published it. This remains unpublished, but uh, Stabler was present when Kripke gave one of the lectures on this topic. And so Stabler developed this simple circuit that he thought, well, let's do it. Let, let's develop a diagram of a circuit that is supposed to compute the identity function. We let the input, put, the input point and the output point uh, be physically implemented in terms of voltage pulses, then we have a conductor in between, and suppose we had the proper mapping and labeling, then we can say that for any not sequence of voltage pulses that is impressed upon the input point, the conductor will transmit the, that exact sequence to the output point. And what you get is a reliable physical system that implements the identity function. So for two sequence, to, for, so, so for a sequence of two voltage pulses at the input point, you get a sequence of two voltage pulses at the output point, and so on. Now, uh, Stabler thought that this showed that we could physically implement the, the identity function. His, 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 uh, th his account is more complex. I'm simplifying, right? But he thinks that this is what actually, or this is a, a, a diagram or an implement physical implementation that can actually achieve, right? for what we call formal determinacy, that is that he can operate and act or follow the identity rule. But as I point out here, if we let 10, the number 10 be an inaccessible number for the sake of argument, um, we can ask, is the device an identity computing device or a 10 counter computing device? This is a similar example given by Kevin Landa, Kevin Landa in an unpublished uh, paper where he also criticizes functionalism along the lines of Kripke. So, and we define a 10 counter function as a function that for any numbers that it takes as input or as, as an argument, it gives you that number as a value. Uh, if that number is less than 10, null otherwise, right? Now suppose that 10 here is the inaccessible number. The circuit diagram or the physical implementation that we've given you will be physically unable 
to distinguish between the identity function and the 10 counter function, right? For any number less than 10, and, and supposing that 10 is an inaccessible number for the sake of argument, uh, the idea would be that no physical properties of this circuit would be able to determinately exclude and therefore decide or determine which of the two, and there could be more, uh, income possibles is being realized. All right, so these two operations are logically non-equivalent operations, addition, uh, addition, identity, 10 counter function, and are not in their application compossible. That is, they, the, the application of one excludes the application of the other. Consider our first thought experiment. If P is a physical mechanism that implements the addition function over the natural numbers, then it is true of P that it is an instance of an operational form that yields the sum of natural numbers. If P, however, is a physical mechanism that implements the quadition function over the natural numbers, then it is true of P that it is an instance of an operational form that yields the cum of pairs of natural numbers. So either the values that P produces are sums because it adds, or the values that P produces are cums because it quads but not equally both. If the properties of P that are responsible for implementing addition cannot exclude quadition from being realized at the same time and in the same respect, then it will be true of P that for any numbers greater than 57, P is at the same time and in the same respect, correct in producing five and, inc and incorrect in producing five. That is, we'll be both adding and not adding at the same time and in the same respect, which is absurd. So for any P to carry out a mathematical operation, it must exclude on account of its intrinsic powers, any other incompossible mathematical operation from being realized at the same time and in the same respect. Yet this is precisely what the Kripkean considerations show the physical cannot do. Admittedly, this is all intuitive argumentation, but it can be shown in a more technical way that any physical mechanism that purportedly carries out some formal operation F cannot exclude its being a case of some other incompossible formal operation F. Appeal to algorithms so as to make the physical powers of the mechanism formally determinable is to miss the point, for algorithms are categorically on a par with the functions in question. That is, they are abstract or pure structures, set of formal rules to be physically implemented. And as such, their physical implementations will be indeterminate amongst incompossible formal structures. Um, okay, so let me just gloss over some points that um, uh, that Kripke makes. I won't be able to read all of this, but so in his unpublished work against functionalism, Kripke, uh, Ross was not aware of the unpublished arguments that Kripke gave, but Kripke got very close to Ross on some points. When we get to Ross, uh, Kripke will, would allow us to establish that the physical cannot carry out the uh, definite formal operations. Ross will allow us to conclude that the intellect or intellectual activity can uh, carry out determinate formal operations. And, and Kripke got very close. One of the things that Kripke uh, inferred from these considerations, for example, was that to account for human computation in terms of physical computation is to represent, is to misrepresent both. For physical computation will be mathematically and logically indeterminate absent the outside formal determination that human beings bestow upon the computing mechanisms. There is no such thing as a mind independent physical implementation of a mathematical or logical operation. Um, how this mind independent determination happens or should be explained is one thing, but that it must be that way is one thing that uh, is a consequence of Kripke's argument. Also, Kripke does not think that uh, subsuming human computation under the category of physical computation is tenable because if it is the case that physical computing mechanisms, right, um, have their formal properties relative, let's say, to the determination of an outside agent, uh, then it will be, it become necessary to explain human computation in the same way, right? But, but Kripke thinks that it is highly impossible to suggest that human beings reason mathematically and logically on account of some human or non-human determiner, interpreter, or designer. 
For example, in order to know whether we reason logically, we are reasoning logically right now, or thinking determinately in terms of addition or identity or quidentity, we would need to console the interpretation of that agent. But this is ridiculous, says Kripke. So the bug must stop with us. And the physicalist approach, even a functionalist, misrepresents what we do when we carry out formal operations and what physical mechanisms do when they carry out formal operations. That is, physical mechanisms, formal properties are relativized to a mind outside the physical mechanism. In human beings, there's no such relativization. That's kind of like the conclusion that Kripke draws. Now, this is as far as Kripke takes it. But Kripke's argument against functionalism seems to point to some sort of fund fundamental asymmetry between physical mechanisms and human beings. What should we conclude from the fact that our mathematical and logical activity cannot be accounted for intelligibly in terms of the physical implementation of mathematical or logical operations? Is it true that our powers cannot be accounted for in physical terms? And so now we move to the second premise, which is uh, Ross's argument for the determinacy of formal understanding. And so now that we've established that the physical cannot realize the formal operation in a determinate way, for the physical cannot exclude income possible formal operations from being realized at the same time in the, set res in the same respect, um, we need to ask whether human intellectual activity is any different. Some, think some thinkers and Ross consider some of these thinkers like Bennett would probably bite the bullet and say that no, that what applies to the physical must apply to the intellect because the intellect has to be physical, right? So um, I don't devote as much attention to this premise because I think by reductio it's easier to prove that thought is determinate and how incoherent or intelligible physicalism turns out if we assume that the intellect is uh, physical and therefore formally indeterminate, okay? Now, there are several arguments that one can give, but I will limit myself to one. Following Russ, assume for reductio that intellectual activity is wholly physical. If this is true, then intellectual activity is formally indeterminate and therefore realizes no definite logical or mathematical operation. But to use, and I'll just skip to this one. So this is kind of like the argument. So if materialism is true and the Kripkin consideration is tr are true, this is what we need to conclude. Right. Um, these are two arguments that show that if materialism is true, we could not do mathematics and we could not do science. Right. That's the implication. Uh, it's like what Ross says. It's like saying that we cannot read these very words. But these arguments have, rather than point to a self-contradiction, point more to the fact that it's absolutely ridiculous to ask us to deny something or reject something that we know that we can do. The one that I want to uh, just highlight briefly, is this one. So assume for reductio that intellectual activity is wholly physical. If this is true, then intellectual activity is formally indeterminate and therefore realizes no definite logical or mathematical operation. But to use formal indeterminacy arguments to establish the formal indeterminacy of thought is a pragmatic contradiction. For one, in order to establish the formal indeterminacy of the physical and therefore extend it to thought, one must engage in an activity that the argument shows the physical cannot engage in. One must make inferences and develop an argument, define and discriminate between formal rules, etc. And two, in order to deny that one can think in formally determinate ways, one has to think in a formally determinate way, namely negation, which is a form of thought. Hence, the argument for the formal indeterminacy of the human intellect establishes, for it requires the formal determinacy of the human intellect. Therefore, human intellectual activity cannot be wholly physical. And I write there that since it is the assumption that intellectual activity is physical, that leads to the conclusion that the intellective must be formally indeterminate, we must reject that assumption. Intellectual activity is not completely or entirely physical. All right, so um, to conclude, I would like to highlight some features as to why there's some sort of a symmetry between the intellect and the physical. So the as, I, as I said in the conclusion to the first premise, 
the physical violates exclusion, right? So the problem with the physical is that it is inclusive with respect to formal operations. If it, admit one, if it admits one, it admits all, which is why it leads to absurdity, right? In which it grounds contradictory counterfactuals. But these logical operations exclude one another from being realized at the same time. So it is clear that the fact that the physical is, let's say, formally, call it formally inclusive, is one of the reasons why it is not a suitable candidate for an explanation of the formal properties, right? Uh, or, or, or for an explanation of what uh, formal operations are. The contrast, in contrast, intellectual activity by these arguments that we briefly given uh, manifests itself to be exclusive as opposed to inclusive. That is, intellectual activity does respect exclusion and therefore can actually realize a definite operation, right? And, which is the, and, we, and this is precisely the reason why we can develop these sort of formal indeterminacy arguments, which require already that we have the capacity for determinate forms of thought. All right, so that will be KRA. Um, please have mercy, this is a sketch. Uh, uh, it's, it's much more thorough. This is a very rich argument. It's something that I, it's an argument that I've come to love uh, uh, simply because there's so much, so many things connected to it and, it and it can get quite detailed and quite technical. But hopefully you get the gist of the argument and where the argument is going and how we get to the conclusion that the intellectual activity, the intellectual activity cannot be wholly physical. So at this point, I would like to say something, I still have some time. I would like to say something about the semantic version of this argument. I'm pretty sure some of you are aware of the, that, um, as I said in the beginning, that there have been, that there's another version of this argument proposed by Ed Edward Faser that, um, argues on the basis of what he calls semantic determinacy or uh, the determinacy of the content of thought to the immateriality of the thought, right? And I, I put a caveat on that because I don't want to say that he commits the content fallacy objection, which we'll, which we'll uh, address, but it is an argument that focuses on semantic determinacy rather than what I have called formal determinacy, right? And if you want to, if you want help uh, or, or you want to get a, a clear idea of what this distinction between semantic and form com comes about, then just think about thinking about addition, which is the, a semantic characterization of the thought, and adding, which is the formal characterization of thought. You can think about addition without adding, but to add, you need to have that formal or form of operation instantiated in a thought pattern, right? So that's how you get to adding, that's how you get to the intellectual act that qualifies as addition. So, one of the things that um, I want to uh, bring attention to is this notion of semantic determination. Um, and though, uh, though Faser published a paper, he, did, he published a paper on, on Ross's argument, and he does talk quite a bit of content. I think I have a quote here when, yeah, uh, where he specifies content. Um, Faser does tend to switch between content and form inadvertently. So he doesn't make the distinction between the two. Sometimes he talks about thinking about addition or the content of the thought being determinate. Then he switches to thinking in accord or following a rule or adding or quoting, et cetera. So there doesn't seem to be a clear grasp that there's two aspects of the intellectual act or, or of these types of intellectual acts. But in, in broad outline, especially after publishing the work, both in talks and, and blog posts, he has made it quite explicit that the notion that he's after here is a semantic determinacy. So it has to do with the content of the thought. Now the question is, what does phaser mean by semantic determination? So there are two notions here that phaser uses to illustrate this sort of determinacy, meanings and conceptual content. Uh, since phaser uses them interchangeably, I take it he thinks they are synonymous, but I might be wrong. The line of reasoning, uh, seems to be as follows. There are incompossible meanings or conceptual contents. Thoughts can discriminate between these incompossible meanings or conceptual contents, say the meaning of the word addition or the concept addition versus the meaning of the word quotation or the concept quotation, and therefore are semantically determinate. Physical processes or things, on the other hand, cannot discriminate between any such incompossible contents or meanings 
and are therefore semantically indeterminate. Hence, thoughts are immaterial. So I would like to express just two worries that I have with this way of cashing out the argument, and then I'll proceed to, to some objections that I want to address shortly before finishing. So my first concern has to do with the content fallacy objection. So this fallacy involves conflating two kinds of facts, facts about the content of our thoughts with facts about what shape or form our thoughts take in our mind. So one commits the fallacy when one infers from the fact that the content of a thought has a certain property, that the thought itself must have that property, right? So Fraser gives this example because he addresses this objection of thinking about a red car and then inferring that your thought is red, right? So this is a, a classical example of a, a illegitimately moving from the content of a thought to the thought itself. Now, in response to the content fallacy objection, Fraser gives this argument scheme that I have copied here, uh, which reads, the objects of thought, premise one, the objects of thought have property X, which entails that they are immaterial, but thought itself also has property X. So thought must be immaterial. And I want to be fair with Fraser. Um, I will give here my reading. And so I frame this not so much as objections, but as concerns and worries. Um, and, and maybe in the Q&A, we could see whether this is an appropriate characterization of his thoughts. But this is, as far as I can read, uh, as far as I've been able to read him, uh, these are my main concerns. So, um, so we have premise one, premise two. The question that here that, that I think we should ask at this point is, how does Facer get premise two? If we get premise two on the basis of the considerations that establish premise one, the content fallacy has been committed. And I explained, premise one is established by showing that meanings or conceptual contents are determinate in ways no physical thing can be, and hence that meanings and conceptual contents are immaterial. But, and, but then all we can conclude from these considerations is that thoughts are about semantically determinate objects, not that thoughts themselves are semantically determinate objects, unless we identify the objects of thoughts with thoughts themselves. But then this seems to commit the content fallacy uh, that uh, is developed by Passenhoff, by the way. Additionally, this argument scheme seems to make viable the claim that thought is only about immaterial objects, since the overall reasoning behind, behind it seems to imply that one of the hallmarks of an object of thought is that it is semantically indeterminate, and that this, and that this implies that it is immaterial. In my case, I say that all of this can be avoided if premise two is interpreted, not semantically, but formally. And I think this is what Facer might have been trying to get at, though not explicitly. So if premise two, but thought itself as property X is taken in the formal way, then premise one, that objects of thought have property X, which entails that they are immaterial, drops out as irrelevant. Since the formal version of the argument need not appeal to the objects of thought, and semantic considerations become secondary. So a more appropriate way to frame this in terms of KRA would be the objects of thought have property X. Property X implies that it is immaterial. Uh, sorry, sorry, not the objects of thought. Would be to take, to eliminate one, take two and say, thought has property X, whatever has X has imma it's, it's immaterial, therefore thought is immaterial and make no reference to the object of thoughts. My second worry with CBA is that I cannot tell, that is the content-based version of the argument, is that I cannot tell exactly what the argument establishes. For example, take the concept addition. The idea seems to be that anything physical is indeterminate with respect to the content of the concept addition. Whereas in human reason, there is a clear distinction between the concept of addition and the concept of quotation. Physical facts cannot preserve such semantic distinction. Facer thinks that the Rossian argument is about conceptual content in general, and as such, he takes the indeterminacy considerations to be true of all concepts, not just mathematical and logical concepts. But is the idea that physical, but is the idea, sorry, here, but is the idea that physical things cannot possess determinate concepts because they can't determine a definite content, call this concept possession, 
Or is it that physical things are indeterminate with respect to the content of concepts because physical things cannot satisfy a determinate concept or a conceptual content called a concept satisfaction? These are two very different claims. And my concern is that the semantic considerations as developed by Facer do not distinguish between the two. Indeed, they seem to support both. And specifically, they seem to support the claim that there's no unique concept that determinately applies to any physical thing. Since for any physical thing, there will be incompossible concepts, which it will equally well satisfy. Unlike this version, KRA focuses primarily on the forms of understanding and intellectual acts. Immaterial immateriality would have nothing to do with conceptual content as such, but with the form of the operations of which we can, of course, think about determinately, but that is not the basis for the immateriality inference. The basis for the immateriality would not be the fact that we can think about such operations, but that we can carry out and do such operations. And so no content fallacy is committed. And CBA, I think, misses the point about what's unique about formal operations. And so here I put more contrast between KRA and FACER's version. And you'll see on the left side that I write that conceptual content of pure formal operations is unique and sui generis but not insofar as these are content or conceptual contents, but insofar as these are thoughts about intellective rules, that is structural principles for organizing normatively and constituting intellectual acts. So what's unique about, so what's unique about addition and our thoughts, our determinant thoughts about addition is that addition is that we can add. There's nothing quite like this about the thought about a horse. There's no such thing of us as horsing right, uh, is not a human activity. And what's interesting about uh, formal operations is that these operations are rules that structure certain types of intellectual activity, right? And so the argument as I develop has, does not extend to all concepts, does not even extend to uh, all kinds of operations. It's, it's limited to formal operations of the sort that we find in mathematical and logical practice. Anyways, we can, if this is not unclear, we can talk about it a bit more later on. So, okay, I have two objections. I won't be able to get to them. So let me just address briefly, I have, I think, three minutes. Let me just address briefly this one, the epistemological fallacy, which Daniel DeHaan addressed as one of the main obstacles facing an immateriality argument. So I think that this objection is misplaced if addressed, if, if, if addressed, you know, at, at KRA. So it would accuse us of not having shown formal indeterminacy, but I haven't shown formal underdetermination. But it seems to me that this conflates really what I would call a categorical argument with an epistemological argument. So what I, what what KRA is um, sorry, what KRA is actually arguing for is that physical properties or mechanisms do not meet the conditions of intelligibility for being candidates or being possessors or being realizers of formal operations. It's not that we do not know that they, that they, that they can do, is that we know what physical computing mechanisms are. We know the kind and type of processes that they instantiate. And this is categorically distinct and unequipped categorically as well to carry out or implement determinately, determinately and intrinsically, that is mind independently. I will not talk about, uh, I, I, will, I won't have time to explain physical computation here, but physical computation does happen. happen but as Kripke says, it's relativized. There's always an anthropological fact uh, somewhere hidden that gives it the full determination. But without the anthropological element outside of the physical mechanism, you have a completely indeterminable uh, system. So one thing is to argue that, it, that it's sheer nonsense to say that the intellect is, is physical, as I think I have shown, because of the consequences that that would imply. It makes no sense to say so. So the argument is one in a Wittgensteinian fashion is one that shows that materialism or physicalism commits us to nonsensical talk, both about PCMs and both about intellectual activity. But even if I were to accept and take the bull by its horns, I think this is a strength of the argument. And I think uh, Ross saw it as well. So the argument, even if it epistemologically framed has a very strong conclusion and is that the physical is necessarily formally underdetermined. That is that we cannot know whether the physical 
ever implements a definite formal operation. So we can say, so we can give the following argument. If phi is physical, then phi must be formally indetermined. Now let phi stand for human intellectual activity. And we have just shown that it is not formally underdetermined because we have shown that we actually reason in accord with definite formal operations. Then we would have to conclude that phi is not physical. So that is a way to take the argument. Russ said in a, in a footnote that he thought that the epistemological argument would prove the same point, but he didn't say how. So I think I got it here. Um, and, and anyway, there's other things that we can say uh, that I can say. Um, if Know that, that if, if we're physical and our intellect is formally underdetermined, we get more ridiculous consequences, such as we wouldn't even be able to know whether we're reasoning logically or mathematically. And you guys right now would not be able to even tell whether you're understanding what formal determination is. Um, all right, so I think I'll leave it here because my 45 minutes just rang, uh, my clock just notified me, but I had another objection that I wanted to address, but maybe we can leave that for the Q&A. All right, thank you.